Tjena tjena, välkommen till Open Doors Online. Kul att du har klickat in. Nu så kommer marsbrikan och det är del 3 av 6. Så fortsätt kolla. På Instagram fortsätter vi att lägga ut information om vad som händer nu med Open Doors under dessa tider. Så kika in den här. Vill du vara med i en hemgrupp så slida in våra DM så fixar vi det åt dig. Open Doors nykoping. Om du vill vara med och ge en gåva så skicka ditt bidrag till detta. Om du vill ha undertext på, på svenska eller engelska eller något så klicka här i den lilla rätten. Nu, över till Mark. Welcome to uh, Open Doors Online. My name is Mark. Uh, this is number three of the series on uh, the cost of following Jesus Christ. Um, welcome. <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians today, chapter 2, verses 12 to 16. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God, and we might impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Emphasize on that last little sentence there. But we have the mind of Christ. Okay, so the cost of following Jesus Christ is that we have to put on the mind of Christ. Um, his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. As we know very well that when we sing worship songs and we read the Bible, we see so much in there of what we wish we could be and what we hope for in our lives. Um, and yet we seem to find that we struggle to actually achieve these, these great goals, these ambitions that we have um, of serving God, of understanding his ways. Um, but I think it's actually quite simple because we have to remember that Christianity is not based upon what I can achieve. Faith about works is dead, absolutely. But I believe that I have the mind of Christ. I believe that I dwell in Christ. I believe that He dwells in me. And in that belief and in that faith that I have in that, that is my strength. My strength is in my faith in what the Bible says. I believe the words of God. Um, so when it says here that we have not received the spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. That is an amazing fact that we read. We have been given. Not shall. We have. Those who believe, those who have accepted Christ, those who, who truly believe that He died and rose again, those who believe that he will come back again. Um, those who believe that he is living now in heavenly places, seated at the right hand of the Father. Um, it's, it's all this language that is um, far beyond where we are. It's like it, it kind of takes us away from the truths, I think, when we think, because we're thinking about heaven, we're thinking about eternity we're thinking about after death it's it's like we're able to just put it off but i think the cost of following jesus one of the costs of following jesus is to take that fact and apply it to your life today where you are um, put on the mind of christ so if we take that and we see that 
Where is my mind? Where, where is your mind? Can we say that I have the mind of Christ? Can you say that you have the mind of Christ? Um, have you got the mind of Christ? That seems almost like a proud thing. It's like, I'm perfect. I have absolute knowledge. I have the perfect knowledge of God. It's what Paul says to the church in Corinth that we have the mind of Christ, we who follow him. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 4 verses 12, it says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The mind of Christ is the Word of God. He is the living Word of God. So, to say that I have the mind of Christ, what I'm saying is I have the living Word of God. And I do. I have the living Word of God. The Word has been written in my heart. It's something that with faith, I have conviction. When I sit there and I leave my Bible, when I sit there and I don't worship, when I, when I spend a whole day without praying, when I, when I spend a day without trying to seek the mind of Christ, without seeking God, I get a feeling that is a horrible feeling in the, the depths of my being that knows that I'm missing something, that there's this knowledge that I am ignoring something that I need. It's, it's, it's like if you haven't eaten all day, your stomach starts to remind you that you haven't eaten today. And it doesn't take much for us to give in to that desire. It's like, yeah, I'm hungry. I'm going to go eat. How easily do we give in to that desire? of wanting more of God, of wanting more of His Word. How much do I want of His Word living in me? And if we read here in Hebrews chapter 4, 12, it says the Word of God is living and active. Okay? It's not a dead law. It's not something for the old times. It's not something that, that can be made irrelevant. It is living and active. When he's speaking here about the Word of God is a two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and spirit. I think that people just kind of put soul and spirit together. We kind of combine them. But it is very different things. Soul and the spirit, they, they are not comparable. Because the soul, my soul is me. It is who I am. Mark Cronin. Your soul is not my soul. We have different souls, we have different personalities. Our soul can be very quickly summed up in three parts. It's our mind, our thoughts. Um, it's our emotions, our feelings. Um, and it is our will, uh, our free will, if we say. The, the ability I have to choose what I want using my mind, my emotions. I then make that decision. Sometimes we make more of our decisions according to our mind. We make it fact-based. Sometimes we make our decisions more according to the emotions. I have a feeling that this is right. Um, that's what makes us different. We, we use our judgments in different ways to make our decisions. An important point that I want to make here is that what I'm trying to say is that in our decision-making, we need to allow God to lead. There's so many problems that we have in the church today and in our lives today because we have a feeling, I have a feeling that I desire this. I desire this in my life and therefore I will think and try and find a place in the Bible that I can justify why I can do it. 
Um, I, I remember not long after I got saved and I met Jesus Christ, I was 19 years old. It was 2004, a um, long time ago for a few of you. <laughs> um, and I remember that I was on fire for God. I sold everything I had. I gave it to the poor. Um, I, if I read something in the Bible, I'd done it. Um, literally, I'd done it. Um, everything in my life had to be led by the Bible. And it was an amazing period in my life. But I also made lots of mistakes, um, obviously. But I remember this one incident where I used to go out on the streets on a Friday evening. I used to go out on many evenings, but especially Friday evenings. I used to go out in England. It's very common that a lot of people go out drinking in the evenings. And they'll be out till 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And I used to live in a town that was, I can say, there was a lot of drinking every evening. But Friday evenings was something crazy. And I wanted to share the love of Jesus with these people. I came from a lifestyle that I used to drink a lot. I had lots of problems in my life. Um, and I wanted to share with these people about Jesus. So I, so I used to go out every Friday evening. And I would just be walking around town. All these people who were drunk and I would just be walking around praying and hoping that God would show me to a situation that I could maybe help someone and testify of who he is. And lots of those situations happened. Um, it was an amazing time. But I was doing this all by myself. And one evening in particular, I remember meeting this wild, drunken woman who was a very beautiful woman, very attractive lady. Um, the exact kind of person who I would have been attracted to, can I say, before I became a Christian, um, in my old life. Um, very similar character to how I used to be. Um, and yeah, we were talking and, you know, she was exceedingly drunk and yeah, it was what it was. So I prayed for her and carried on, but my, I couldn't leave her from my mind. I had this desire that I was thinking, yeah, but God, you saved me. Of course you can save her. So what does it matter if we have a relationship? Because, you know, God, you can just save her. You, you can make it into a Christian. Um, and yeah, I can't remember how much time went by, but I used to meet her occasionally on the evenings when she was out in the town and I'd be around praying and we'd end up talking about life and these kind of things, but she never showed any interest in God or changing her life. Um, but I kept this little thing of hope that, you know, yeah, but God, you could, you could save her. I even ended up finding from the Bible a place where I could even say to God, but look, look here, what you say. And it's in Hosea, um, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 2. And uh, Hosea was a prophet of God, and he was told by God to marry a prostitute, to uh, demonstrate to Israel that Israel was being a prostitute to God. Um, and I was like, God, you know, look. If your prophet in the past could marry a prostitute, she can't have been a believer. You know, <laughs> it's amazing the places in the Bible we can find when we want something, when we, we want the word of God to line up with something that we already desire. Um, luckily, I didn't allow my emotions and the desire I had to completely rule me. I still had my mind and I still had the Word of God. I was reading the Word and I was reading constantly about not to be drawn into temptation, um, leaving the old life and I was able to use this living and active Word of God as a sword to judge between that, okay God, is this you speaking to me that I should be with this lady who is obviously not suitable for the lifestyle I've chosen? Or is just just the old me trying to desperately get away to to get what I want through the Word of God? Um, it's a it's a scary thing to look back on how much I've done this in my life, um, trying to justify my own desires 
by the word of God. Put on the mind of Christ when it comes to an important decision about being in a relationship or your sexuality or these huge things that are so much driven by desire. Desire must not be the thing that leads our life. It must be the word of God that is living and active. We give up too early. We give up too soon in seeking God in our prayers. That we, we almost don't expect them to be answered. I think that the cost of following Jesus is that we have to expect our prayers to be answered. And therefore, that means that we have to expect to be able to communicate with God, which means that we have to allow that communication to actually direct our lives. I said before, um, and I'm going to repeat that the word can divide between soul and spirit. And I spoke about our soul. I didn't say so much about spirit. Um, we are made up of three parts, body, soul and spirit. Um, in the image of God, he's also made up of three, three and one. Um, and the spirit is something that people can completely lose connection to. If we always follow our own emotions and our wills, then we break the order of what God created and God ordained that our spirit should be top, then the soul and then the body. Um, God's revelation is the spirit. It's where the Holy Spirit can dwell. He's spiritual, he can't dwell in our body, he dwells in our spirit. Um, unfortunately, we have the ability with our soul, with our mind and our will and our emotions to ignore the spirit. That's the strength that we have. But the word of God is a living sword and dividing. He can show us what is coming from God and what is coming from us. And this is where we need to be standing in faith, in trusting that God is a living sword. He is a living word. He is active and he wants to lead our lives. So when you're in a dilemma that is led so much by desire, like I said, it can be sexuality, um, maybe you desire somebody from the same sex, maybe it can be a relationship that you desire. There's lots of things that we can desire and we can say that, but look, it's, it's how I was born, it's, it's who I am. Um, but instead of allowing our emotions to be the, the standard of how we judge what is right, this is where we need to let the word of God lead us. And we need to take our life to the word and allow God to lead us through these desires that we have. I think that desire for relationships with physical people, sexual relationships, is one of the biggest traps that many Christians fall into is by having a wrong relationship and being bound by it afterwards, by the guilt, by the shame. Jesus can release from guilt, from shame. He can free you from that. But he can also lead you in your life. And that is the cost of following him. It is that we need to believe that he answers our prayers, that he listens and he's willing to guide us. So open your Bible and read it. I have two questions that I'm going to leave you with that I hope you can discuss. And if anything I'm bringing up, I know I'm talking very shortly and I'm talking, you know, on a lot of subjects that need discussion and prayer. Um, if you need any of that, you can contact me. My uh, telephone number will come up now here and uh, you can uh, call me, send me a message. We can arrange to meet, have a coffee. I can talk whatever it may be you want to talk about, um, get in touch. Two questions. Question one, think of an example when you have tried to make the word of God fit your own desires. Like I gave the example earlier, um, I managed to even find a, a place in the Bible where God told a prophet to marry a whore <laughs> just to try and justify this desire I had. 
Um, like I said before, that I hope that these discussions that you're having now, you know, it's not just to talk about the greatness of the Word of God, but it's also to share our weaknesses with one another and to be help ourselves by opening up. Um, to have a proper discussion about life with each other. Um, support one another. That's what these discussions are about. This is what home groups are about. Um, so if you're not in a home group, also contact me. You can also email me. Um, I know that's uh, not many do that anymore, but there we go. Question number two. How can we have the mind of Christ? How can you put on the mind of Christ? 1 Corinthians 2, verses 16, the last little bit of that verse. But we have the mind of Christ. 